The Lord be with you. And also with you. Mike, do we have a photo of Mary and Martha and Jesus? Okay. So sometimes I, I find an image um, and I learn from it, and sometimes I already have an idea of what should be said, and I find an image to match it. And, and such is the case today. And so as the church is in the fullest um, season of opportunity that it ever could be for a pastor to get busy and work hard, I ditch out. I leave town. Because I needed to be Mary in today's picture, just for a moment. And I had, I felt like this congregation's encouragement, and I'm giving you thanks for that. Um, this is my first week of sabbatical I've taken in at least a year, and it was very much needed. And it was amazing. And I will tell you more details another day, but it was exactly what I needed. It was a beautiful environment with mountains and streams and deer and squirrels everywhere, including in my food sometimes. Um, it was a collection of lay people mainly um, and colleagues from the Lutheran tradition, which is what I grew up in but also from the Muslim faith and the Jewish faith and a variety of atheists among us who just like this spiritual centering spot. And I was cared for with good words. We had Bible study every day. We had worship every evening. I had at least one hike a day. I had lots of healthy meals and good conversation and a fair amount of rest for my soul. And in all of this, you have been in my prayers. And in all of this, I've carried with me um, the sermon I preached right before I left here, and you've all forgotten it by now, but that's okay. It's okay. We were just beginning in that 10th chapter of Luke a few weeks ago. We were just beginning as Jesus was sending out the 70 and saying, go and prepare the way for the Lord, and look for places of hospitality. And when you find those places, enjoy those places, and stay as long as is necessary, and then come back and share with me what you have experienced. And I think with the children, I said, you know, Jesus had 70 people around him, and I'm not sure if we have 70 today, and then Don Orange, who's on a family reunion in an excused absence from church today, um, Don Orange came up to me later in the service and said, Pastor, including you, there are 71 people here. And so in my absence, you have shared the word of God and the peace of Christ with one another, and you have done amazing things. And I have been a part of... of one of my favorite things, and that is exploring the Hebrew text. And I've done that with, with a variety of scholars and a variety of laypersons who just want to make that story their own. And so we've shared so many different angles that um, when, when Melba said to me this morning, I'm afraid you're gonna go the wrong way with this, I said, there is no wrong way. There's just only that next way, and then that other way. But I do believe that, that Christians have been somewhat at a disadvantage when we have not adequately spent time looking at the Hebrew texts through the context in which they were given us. And with that continued Hebrew understanding of what these texts might mean for us, not just then, but today. And then, oh my goodness, one of my favorite moments was on an interfaith service when our imam then said, and in our tradition, this is what we do with that text. And he dealt with the texts of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael, as long with the texts of Mary and Jesus and the angel Gabriel. 
But for today, let me share a couple of the themes that, that tend to go throughout the Bible, the Christian Bible that we hold on to, that, that might inform our conversation. The first is, the, is the, the issue of sibling rivalry. Because from the beginning of time, there has been this, this need and want to, to um, find out who's the favorite and to rally against that. To make us the favorite and them not. And that plays out over history and over present politics in so many wild and crazy ways. But for today, we look at um, Cain and Abel as the first children who ultimately struggled because one was convinced that God or Father loved him most, and the other just couldn't have that. And, and instead of wrestling with God for blessing, instead of, of the two brothers coming together and realizing they were each beloved children of God, they decided to go against one another. And one whole generation or one whole strain of people was lost in that battle. One whole set of, response, of possibilities came to an end that day. And then we had the challenge of Isaac and Ishmael. And from that came two different, three different faith traditions. And then we had the challenge of, of um, Esau and Jacob, and then we had Joseph and all of those many other brothers, and today we have Mary and Martha. And how many different books and sermons have been written on which one had it right? Was it Martha that was the one who served and cared for people in practical fashion? The one that gave everything she had to this visitor, Jesus, was she the one that got it right? Or was it Mary, who was not consumed in those idle tasks, that she didn't have time to sit and listen to that which was most important? Which one got it right today? And I'm not going to ask us to vote, because the answer is both. So let's start with that. Let's start with, with um, our African-American preacher of the week, along with our Jewish and Islam and white, um, Caucasian-American, and every other person there, our Jewish female rabbi, saying, what if we all just looked at one another and said, hey, let's come together around our divisions. And let's find a way toward wholeness together. Imagine that, if you would, as something that Jesus might want for us, or Mohammed, or our Creator. What might that look like? Well, I believe Tom was continuing through the Gospel, the 10th chapter of Luke, and he shared the story of the Good Samaritan. And so we have Jesus telling his disciples, look for hospitality and go to extreme measures. It should be uncomfortable for you. And so Martha is listening, even if she doesn't even realize it, but the one who's putting this gospel together is intentionally linking the story to those other two. Martha is the one that listened to that need for hospitality, that need for care. Jesus and his disciples, however many, but in this picture there are a couple. Do you see them in the gray areas? Mm -hmm. They're in the home of Martha, it says. Martha has invited them in, and Martha is determined to care for them. Martha is getting it right. And what is going on with Mary? Mary is breaking the rule. Let's be clear about that. However, she's with Jesus, and Jesus has gotten really good by now. We're in the 10th chapter of Luke. He's gotten really pretty good at breaking the rules as well. Now, in some of the images, and I don't think this one is quite as clear, the, the, some of the disciples in the background are frowning and scowling at Mary. 
Because who is she, a, a young girl, to be sitting at the feet of Jesus and among these disciples? It is said that in, in, the, in the day in which this was written, um, a, a boy would wake up in the morning and, and give thanks to God that he was actually, yes, a boy. Because girls were uh, icky. <laughs> And that he was a Jew and not a Gentile. That he was a favored one. That he was free and not a slave. And it was said in those days that it would be better for the, the Torah, which is the five books of Moses, the Torah to be thrown into the fire and consumed than be, to be put in the hand of a woman who would defile it. Holy moly. That's serious language, folks. What is Jesus doing today? He is putting the Torah in the heart of Mary. And he is, one of the photos, I don't, yeah, not this one. He, he's, I don't know, does he look mean or scary? I don't, I hope not. I don't want him to be. There's one where he actually puts his hand on Martha. And he says, Martha, Martha. <laughs> It's all, it's all right. I know you're worried about this because we're breaking the rules, Martha. I know you've got work to do over here. This is my, the Joanne translation. I know you've got work to do over here. It'll get done. Come and be with us also. Between the lines is an invitation to Martha to join the crowd. Yes, there is something being broken this day. But there's an invitation from Jesus for all of us to be there at his feet. To receive his holy word and to be nourished by it. There is always time for that next task. To feed the hungry. To bring release to the captives. But first we have Sabbath. First we have rest for our souls. First we come before Jesus with all of God's family, or family as we find it. And we hear his holy words. And we allow those words to breathe new life into us. Rabbi Johanna is from um, a synagogue in Seattle. I've interacted with her before. She came and, and taught um, at my community college class in Moses Lake. She was the first Jew that anyone in my class had ever seen. Not to mention um, Anila Abzali, who wore her hijab and came and spoke alongside her. Oh my goodness. I want to show you a few more pictures, Mike, if you don't mind, of my um, vacation, my sabbatical, and see if you can Ooh, find Pastor Johan in, this, in any of these pictures. That's pretty. That's pretty. This is where I was last Sunday morning. That's nice. That's where we had worship. <coughs> That's where I slept. Ooh, that's pretty. Yeah. Oh, dear. And that's who tried to eat my dinner one day. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's my, that's my window looking out. That's pretty. That's nice. Wow, pretty waterfall. That's pretty. There we go. That was my way out. That's we. Have, you have to go out by boat. That's nice. And you see this woman resting on the rocks beside the sign. That is our rabbi. She 
when she explained the reformist tradition to us, she said, you know what, all of those many rules and regulations were written during a very specific time in history. And they apply to that very specific time in history. That's nice. But we don't live in that time anymore. <laughs> and so she said, the Jewish people in the reform tradition, now if I, if I were speaking from the Orthodox tradition, it'd be different. But from the reform tradition, these stories that we are gifts from our ancestors, they are stories of their struggling with God. Oh. But they are a gift. And there may be opportunities when the community of faith can veto some of the rules and the regulations. Hence, there are female rabbis. And hence, there is an inclusion of all people in their congregation. And hence, she feels called to share what she knows of her faith with the whole wide world, starting with a few of us at Holden Village, hoping we will share it with others. I know in my absence, Mike joined many of you, Wanda and others who went over to Mill Plain. And, and you joined with other folks from Battleground and talked about what it's like to be in a reconciling congregation. More and more, the leaders of our faith communities are wanting to come together and support one another. It's crazy out there. The United Methodist Church is, is, is doing this. And how do we come together and share what we know and what we believe of a God that loves each and every one of us and wants us all to be blessed by God's holy word. Amen.